for this week. The title is What is it to fail spiritually? <laughs> so, you know, when somebody asked Swami Vivekananda, this was in Kolkata, and that was a very big time. It was the biggest town in the time in Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda lived. And, you know, somebody asked him, This man did not believe in God at all. And uh, he said, What is, you always keep talking of Divine Mother. How is your Divine Mother any different from a street woman? You know? And, like, you know, very strong question. And a beautiful answer. Swami Vivekananda said, Well, they're both my mother. One teaches me how to be, and the other teaches me how not to be. So we can also learn many things from failures and how to avoid failure. And in the hospital circles, we always heard this wonderful, you know, not wonderful stories, <laughs> but uh, stories, spine-chilling stories, which would tell you how not to be. You know, they say even the worst physician can be a very good example. So once committed, an error once committed is a lesson for generations to come. So let's see what this topic will bring to us. What is it to fail spiritually? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The first passage is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25. Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, five of them wise and five foolish. They await their bridegroom, the Christ consciousness. The wise virgins keep the oil in their lamps, symbolic of their devotion lit through the night. The foolish virgins placed no oil in their lamps. These foolish ones are like the average devotee, going through the motions of outer ritual, but keeping no fire of love burning in the heart. When the bridegroom's coming is announced, the foolish virgins realize their mistake and hasten out to purchase oil. During their absence, the Christ consciousness comes and embraces those who have been awaiting him with devotion. The foolish ones, by their lackluster devotion, are not accepted by him. Watch therefore, Jesus told his listeners, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. This is a longer reading, it's a few pages. In autobiography of the yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda describes the foolish virgin consciousness he encountered in the Mahamandal Hermitage he stayed in as a young man in Banaras. I was pleased, he wrote, that my new home possessed an attic where I managed to spend the dawn and morning hours. The ashram members, knowing little of meditation practices, thought I should employ my whole time in organizational duties. They gave me praise for my afternoon work in their office. Don't try to catch God so soon. This ridicule accompanied me, one of my, accompanied one of my early departures towards the attic. Later during meditation, I felt lifted as though bodily to a sphere uncircumscribed. Thy master cometh today. A divine womanly voice came from everywhere and nowhere. This supernal experience was pierced by a shout from a definite locale. A young priest named Habu was calling me from the downstairs kitchen. Muganda, enough of meditation. You are needed for an errand. The Divine Mother's words were not spoken for the benefit of that priest, the foolish virgin, but for Mukunda, the wise virgin. For this was the day his Guru, Sri Yukteswar, came to him. Grieve not, friends, if you feel that you have been foolish. No error is forever. Someday, if you keep your lamp lit now, your opportunity will come. In the Bhagavad Gita, the sixth chapter, Krishna promises every devotee. Arjuna, none who works for self-redemption will ever meet an evil destiny. Spiritual failure, though a deep disappointment, is always temporary. Eternal hellfire is but a projection of vindictiveness in the human mind. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken 
to mankind. speak on what's my topic for the week and they said God remembrance and I said oh I'll show up and then, then I'll talk because you know those things are easy uh, uh, remember God see God in everything you know master my guru you start speaking of the five gurus each of them symbolize God in a different way each person master says symbolizes God in a different way and uh, but here I was I saw this topic and I said well I must have some experience <laughs> So let me dig into that. And uh, but I think before I begin on that, I'd like to just share with also because it's a good group today. Sorry, I, I should be standing here. Uh, I will I will share with you all uh, this wonderful meeting we had recently in Delhi. As many of you know, we had our annual center leaders meeting, and uh, I was very surprised to reach them, listen to the opening comment, and Jayaji, who is our spiritual director of Ananda India, and uh, he says. It's very nice to have you all over here and it's very good to meet year after year, fourth time this time. I said, oh, fourth time? For me, it was the first time. And then before I could you know, assimilate his, the meaning of his words, somebody else stood up and said, yes, it's wonderful to see how earlier the center leaders used to meet in Gurgaon because that was the only center in the country. <laughs> then we decided to meet between Delhi and Gurgaon because there were two centers. Now there was Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata, Mumbai to come, and Noida. So there was a big, big, uh, twice the size of this place, a living room where we all were meeting. And this beautiful uh, information that they shared, which is very obvious on one level, for those who have seen that outgrowth, also one of them commented, he said, isn't it so wonderful that all of us now today who are leading centers used to have food in the same house? That when Swamiji came, many of these wonderful souls had come with him and they were serving with him and doing what was required. But before they realized, the work had made them center leaders now. And in their own place, you know, they're channeling the Guru's energy. So I'm just sharing the things that delighted me, you know, uh, watching that conversation. And of course, then one of the other beautiful things that happened, you know, normally when you think of meetings, you say, oh no, <laughs> I hope they'll serve coffee and you know, something like that. But this meeting was so amazing. It lasted around two days. And you would think, my lord, you know, the exact number of people come out of the room as had entered. But everybody was energized, so joyful, so happy so full of exchange of energy and uh, ideas and you know it's good it's good you know uh, somebody once said once Dalai Lama told one of the students of our school in Ananda village he said sir what should I do next he says travel and which was to say that if you travel you'll see a world much bigger than yours you'll meet different people like Swamiji would say often you know he said I've traveled so much I don't go to places anymore to see the earth and the sky and the rivers and you know the gorges and mountain peaks. He says, now I just go to appreciate that human nature is always the same. You know, I may not know a person's language, but if I smile at him, he will smile back, like, back at me. And such beautiful things he shared. So one of the things which I gathered in that meeting was uh, every person had to make a presentation. How your center, what is your center going to do in one year? And you know, uh, what is your vision for five years? And that brought this uh, civic science in my mind. We used to have these civic textbooks, five, government five-year plans. <laughs> and sometimes the biggest question in the exam used to be, what was the government's five-year plan from 1962 to 1967? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? <laughs> Why am I supposed to know that? It didn't concern me, you know. But this plan concerned me. It concerned my work, it concerned the Guru's work, it concerned everybody. So we were all, you know, just sitting and thinking, well, why, where do we see ourselves? 
and very, very beautiful things came about. I was going in the car with somebody in the meeting, and I realized that in Bangalore, they're doing more events nowadays with the family. They got a center right next to a big park. And they say, oh, we all, sometimes we sit inside, often we go outside, and the children come, and we have food outside. There's a potluck. We do open kirtans. He said, I've become, this Acharya of he said, I've become so well known in the jogging circle of the park, that I have to hide my face each time I want to take a, my own walk. He said, I've become so popular over there. But isn't that a nice thing? You know, once somebody asked me, uh, do these spiritual teachings work? I've heard of this glow on the face of people. Have you seen that glow? And I thought, I, my face must not be having any glow. Otherwise, you would not be doubting this. <laughs> but then, very quickly, I had to answer him something. And I said, the glow on the face, glow on the face. <laughs> I said, no. why don't you look at of my masters? And then immediately it was like it cut through all his reasoning and we were wondering why it didn't strike him. That ah, isn't that, that was that is what impressed me when I bought autobiography of a yogi. I was not looking for that book, but I saw the face and so this is a very unusual face, you know, it's like a very different face. Somebody once saw Yogananda in a restaurant and she was walking with her husband in Chicago maybe, and she says, Let's go there, let's go and meet that man. And he says, why? No. And she says, no, I have to meet him. I've never seen such a beautiful human face. He has to be, he has to be the most spiritual man I have ever known. So that, that is the, you know, the beauty of uh, practicing these things and such. So anyway, uh, I learned from there and I shared these things. I said, well, uh, today everything, everything is good. You know, it's winter time and I hope people get a seat inside. But uh, last month, twice, people were standing outside, you know, unable to get in. There was so much, uh, it was so packed. And I said, we would like to have a bigger city center. We would like to, you know, engage everybody 100% in seva or contributions and, uh, you know, doing retreats and this and that. I said, we, uh, this is our vision. And we would also like to attend to family. I said, it has never uh, struck my consciousness this hard. But I said, this time when I met, you know, are the center leaders. I'm also willing to put energy into you know families and children and doing th such things. And actually, so interestingly, even as I was speaking, there was a workshop happening over here. Gorja was conducting a workshop, and weeks before she had also conducted one. So I thought later I said, well, we were conducting something for children. How could I feel so bad about not doing these things? So many beautiful things happen over here. And then, of course, what else did I share? I shared about this online thing. It's a very good thing you all should know. You know, many a times, uh, and that's why I'm very grateful nowadays to people when they come to any event because uh, it has become difficult. You know, I used to be in this place and I was once lost. It was 1985. I was lost. Uh, I went walked from home and I didn't know how to go back. So I started crying on the road, and this gentleman comes. He's like, "Why are you crying?" I said, "I don't know where's my home, and I, I can't see my mom and my friends, and you know, I need to I need to go home." And he said, "Where do you stay?" I told him the army again. He took me, and you know, somehow through my dad being a doctor and then some location, they found me basically, I was safe. Now I look at the city and I think if I was four years old, five years old now and <laughs> lost my way, it's not the same city anymore. It's not the same traffic. It's not the same consciousness, you know, for good or bad. The Bhagavad Gita is good to listen to these books. They say these waves come and go and anything which sees a high peak, you know, has to go down. Somebody was talking about the glorious days Patna had seen, you know, when in the times of Chandragupta Maurya and the wonderful Sojan. Now, Patna is practically like Lavasa, a ghost town, nobody likes it. Not now, years ago it was the case, but now people are again going back. So these things come and go. But uh, one thing that Jyotish Ji emphasized, he came upon this, by the way, that's the picture of our present Dharmacharya. <coughs> and he suggested a few years ago that we start what is called an online community. And he said, in this community, Everybody nowadays has a smartphone. They work, you know, they have a computer at home. And if they're not able to come because of some family commitment or because of some transportation issue, traffic issue, cities have grown big. He says, just turn your phone on and turn your computer on. And it happened with me. You know, I was in Lavasa doing a shift, and my patient left uh, close to 6:20 or so, and I was just resting. And then it struck me, oh, at 6:30 p.m., Jyotish and Deviji are doing a webinar in Gurgaon, but uh, our internet in the hospital was not working. So I had this smartphone, 
and I said, let me see if it can something and if I can hear through this. And logged on to it. And it says, connect to webinar? I said, yes, connect to webinar. And then the phone says, you need to download this app. You are otherwise you can to watch this thing. And I said, okay, install the app. The app is installed. Within two minutes, I was registered and I was watching the webinar uninterrupted for one hour. So, you know, you can't go to Guru now, you watch these things. So he mentioned those things and we are devoting actually Khan Brahmachari Khan who has come from America and you see this wonderful camera of his. Um, our orders have also been placed and everything in Delhi has been extremely generous to donate huge amounts of money for outreach. And the intention is that every center should have a good location, they should have a good uh, webinar, good internet, and good outreach, a separate room where such satsangs and even classes, we have started doing level one classes, paid classes online. And people in cities where we are not there, because autobiographies in all cities nowadays. So people who, so if, you know, they are now taking these classes, we had a, a Tamil Nadu, a session just for Tamil Nadu, and four people, they registered. Uh, for the online class and they took lessons uh, you know, in meditation, that's a wonderful thing. And I'll speak about the importance of meditation in our class. Another thing that comes to my mind, Jyotish, she said the web is a wonderful tool for us. He had written an article which is the opening part of his book, How to Meditate, uh, uh, years ago, decades ago. And that article was sent to the Times of India speaking tree just like two weeks ago. The day we were having the meeting, Jyotish ji said, uh, that that article has got 95,000 views already, and isn't that wonderful? If 95,000 people read how to meditate, and that speaks by itself of the Dwapara ways, you know, in which these teachings should go. And uh, you hear earlier that you know, Master says, in my Guru's ashram. You know, people who come from all over the world in Sri Pateshwar's ashram, likewise for Lahari Mahashaya. And of course, Master from then reached out, and Swamiji also reached out, people would come to him. But, you know, in God, God has made us, and but there's no ego in from his side. He always is happy to reach out to us. He's always there to suggest something to us, to inspire us. But then, we think, you know, we are ego possessors. We think, well, if he's come this far, maybe he'll take me all the way. <laughs> but that's not how it is. You know, Krishna comes to suggest, he comes to guide, and then as he did to Arjuna, but then it is Arjuna who should fight. Arjuna who has to. It has even been promised to Arjuna. Krishna told Arjuna, don't even worry about killing the wrongdoers. He says, I have already killed them. Why don't you finish the task of God is in it's, it's, it's fathomless actually to comprehend his ways. But then I, I understand then why did he create Arjun? Why did he create devotees? I think he created us so that we may enjoy our expansiveness. You know, when we are small, we are so eager to simply stand on our feet. You know? or then when a child learns to crawl in the first time, he just tried, he's like a horse, small horse, you know, going all over the place and not, uh, you know, put down by any challenges and such and then you know we start walking we want to run we want to travel we want to see but then a devotee comes to understand this is a poor i should say a person when he becomes a devotee <coughs> he comes to understand that the physical plane itself in which we are a part of is terribly limited yeah i was once thinking about non-attachment and i said how can i best understand this and i said well <clears throat> Because Master said non-attachment is a very high virtue. So I said, you know, of course it does not mean not caring. But I said, let's say tomorrow morning I wake up to the news that, uh, you know, you have a throne in Delhi and you are going, that's going to be the center of the world, let's say. And you, you are the king of the world. Let's say, you know, if, if sometimes things might come that easy. <laughs> you know, what's the harm in dreaming? So I thought, let me see what attachment can bring and why it might be too bad for me. So I thought, let me get attached to the whole world for a moment. So I said, okay, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be the king of the world. Won't that be wonderful? So I said, what will I do the first thing? So I said, I have good breakfast. <laughs> Those who know me, <laughs> know me. <laughs> I said, I have a good breakfast. Then, I don't want to listen to too many complaints, <laughs> so I'll go about seeing the place. The moment I thought, I'll see the place, I said, what? How much will you see? I said, I'll see Delhi. 
and maybe I'll see Agra, maybe I'll see Assam, maybe I'll see Japan. You know where it's going? <laughs> How much can you see? What does seeing bring in any way? Some seeing is good. You see a flower, you feel nice. The other one is that you feel nice because you have having joy inside. A dead person cannot respond to anything. A feverish person will not respond to his own favorite meal. So when you are happy, everything is good. So when you're not, so in the moment I said, Lord, no, I'm good in Vatunde. <laughs> no Delhi for me. No such things. And I realized that non-attachment is, but again, you see, why did God create the world? Why did he create a good breakfast? That's his way, you might say. That's his way to treat everybody uniquely. He gives us free will. You know? Help yourself. You know, do this. And Yogananda would say, well, if you have to live, if you have to create a dream, you know, they say this life is a dream. He says, why live a bad dream? Why? If you do something good, he says, in your consciousness, you're assured that this way or that some good will come to you. He says, why not live in that inside inter internal security? And he says, from there, he says, once you've lived a good dream, good, uh, long enough, he says, then you start realizing, well, it's a dream after all. And then we pine for God, then we call to God, and then we understand his leela. So in this beautiful story, uh, you know, it's tragic on one level when somebody fails spiritually. It's not a good thing, I'm sure. Swamiji says it's a deep disappointment. But on the other hand, uh, it's good. You know, Shivaji had a, a guru, uh, and Shivaji's guru once went into ecstasy and he wrote this very beautiful extract. And that day, it was his prayer to Divine Mother you know, show me why you have created this world. You know, show me what this is all about. So he meditated, and in his meditation, he had a vision and later he wrote it down in the book, uh, Das book? Uh, das book. Das book. In that book, there's this extract. He says, oh, oh mother, why so much suffering? Why this suffering? I see entire cities are drowning in this river. Why? Why mother? But he says, I, you were, I was told, you gave me this vision. I, I'm told that you're good. Let me come to you and ask you why. And he says, you know, I start swimming in this river. And he says, I'm swimming and I'm swimming. He says, now I see fewer people. But still, mother, you're dissolving entire hills. He says, why this fury, mother? Why? And then, you know, he says, well, now I'm going upstream. The river is going uphill. I don't think I'm moving by my own strength. Is it by some means that you're pulling me? And he says, oh, of course you're pulling me. Of course you're pulling me. And then he says, oh. Is that you in the form of light? And he says, ah, ah, I've come to see you. I have seen you, I have seen you. And then he says, and then you turn me around. And he says, you have dried me, mother. You're so kind, you have dried me. And he says, you turn me around. And then I see there was no river. It's just to say, you know, he was a yogi. He was speaking of the spine. They say in our spine, we have these chakras. God, Brahma uh, Sivaganda said in autobiography, made man as a special creation. He said there is no link, there is no link in animal <coughs> and man world. It will never be found. Uh, for around 160 years they've been looking and they keep promising every few years, oh, it's going to come, oh, we've reached close and we found the tail of this animal and the <laughs> you know, spine of that human and it seems like, yes, this is where it happened. It has not happened and Master said they will never find it. He says, with the seven spinal, six spinal centers and the thousand petal lotus, man was God's special creation where free will was given. So everything in nature runs, you might say, by God's conscious intent. And everything from there is God's, you know, creation. And then man has his free will to make things this way or that. And uh, so that's what the yogi was saying, that in the beginning, in the lower chakras, when our consciousness is low, you know, we don't enjoy the world so much. You know, people, they are into food and too much of alcohol and power games and alcohol and ego games. And he said, you know, everybody, the whole world is drowned in this mother. What are you showing me? He was a yogi consciousness. And then he says, I'm moving up, up, up the stream. And when he reaches the heart, even before that, in the where the self-control he said, you know, oh, I see you're dissolving entire hills of past bad habits in people. That we have a strong will, we have strong control, and you know, then we can 
you know, uh, demolish those obstacles very easily. And then by the time he reached the heart and the spiritual life, he could see God one to one. And he said, this is such a difficult journey. It's always in the heart to have uplifted feelings at all times, to be kind, to be generous, to be loving, cooperative. These are qualities of the upper chakras. He said, it's just so hard. I can't imagine I'm doing this myself. And that's when he said, oh no, you are making me do this by your divine magnetism. I'm able to be that way. It's nothing that I am doing. And then when he reached here, he turned around and he saw that this was all a dream. The master would say that, but as long as you're living, he said, you should use your willpower in your courage to live properly. And that's the story, uh, rejoicing on one level and tragic on the other of those ten virgins that uh, uh, Hari Mahasaya said, if you don't invite God in the summer of your life, how do you expect Him to come to the And that when things are going good for us, when we have good friends, when there is health, you know, Swamiji towards the last few years of his life, he would enter a room and he would always say, I always tell people don't get old, <laughs> but the trouble is no one listens to me. Which <laughs> is not old age in physical form will come to us, but never get old age, you know, old by spirit, and never get uh, formed or fixed in your habits and thinking patterns. Somebody recently was telling me, you know, well, you know, how I read so much of the Bhagavad Gita, how can I ever do anything that is mentioned over there? It's just too much to do in one lifetime. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, first of all, Yoganath, he said, do only one, if you do even 1% of what I'm telling you, he said, you will find God in this life. Secondly, in the last chapter of the Gita, where Krishna says, uh, the chapter is, thou shall attain me, Krishna <coughs> says, oh Arjuna, if you cannot <coughs> devote your life to me, if you cannot do penance and austerity and yoga practice and techniques of meditation, if you cannot even serve me, and in serving anything else, you fail in all aspects. He says, Arjuna, bring me your failures and you shall attain me. And I thought about it that it's, he's not, on one level, he's making it easy. Why would he make it so impossible? He wants to meet us. Bringing our failure to God is not so easy because we don't accept it. And uh, when we can do that, when we have such devotion in our heart that we say, Lord, I must have gone wrong. Like how I was saying, if this topic has come to me, I must have some experience. Then, then in that devotion, it doesn't matter actually after a while whether it is the summer or the winter because we realize God is watching you and if he's watching me, he'll watch me when I'm kicking the bucket, he'll watch me when I'm young, he'll watch me when I'm old and that, uh, at that time, you know, because he mentions very clearly, the human mind will try to figure but he says, Jesus says very clearly, no man knows at what hour and what day the Son of Man will come. So there's a time that only, and Swami, uh, Swami used to say, he says, God knows everything, but that doesn't help us. <laughs> we don't know it. <laughs> so from our side, we have to try it. And that's the beautiful Leela. Over the years, I have seen myself becoming stronger. And I became strong by <coughs> accepting and first of all, facing my weaknesses. And when you do that, then you can see some intelligence in God's plan that he is simply trying to strengthen me. <laughs> For that reason, I care I love Gandhi. Even though Master declared that he made no saints, Master said his book was written with devastating candor that he had dissected his own self so much. Master said it was rare in the whole uh, history of autobiography writing that somebody was so honest you know, he opens his autobiography by saying, let every reader know, which by now is tens of millions, that everything I have done in life is for the search of God. And then he closes the book by saying, let nobody feel that I have found him <laughs> by any measure. He says, twice I have heard him, but I cannot claim to have found him. When you have that kind of view of yourself, and the understanding that God is watching, then I think there's hardly any distance that remains. Because you said, Lord, I can't swim uphill. These are my hills. And Divine Mother says, you know, 
how did you ever think you were going to dissolve those hills by yourself, you know? Keep coming, just keep looking in my direction, keep meditating, keep praying, keep behaving yourself, keep your consciousness high, and you shall